Welcome to Clear Creek Community Church Online. We exist to lead unchurched people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. We are a people, not a place, and are sent to make a difference in our world. Clear Creek gathers for worship online and across multiple campuses in the Bay Area of Houston. For more information, visit us at clearcreek.org. Well, again, welcome to Clear Creek Community Church Online. We are glad that you're engaging with us today. Hey, we find ourselves in week two of a series we've called Plot Twist. So think about your favorite movie or maybe a favorite Netflix show. Man, all great stories have that element of the unexpected, those twists and turns in the story that you just didn't see coming. Well, in a year where it's been really easy to be disappointed or discouraged, maybe even question the character of God, what if there was a twist in that story? So we're gonna look at some lesser known stories of the Bible and see how they impact our view of God in the here and now. And so today you're gonna to hear from Yancey Arrington, our teaching pastor. But before we do, we said this last week, if you're connecting with us online, it'd be really helpful to know just a little bit more about you so that we can serve you better. So on the screen, you're gonna see a QR code for a short survey. It's just two questions. Or you can type in the short code on slido.com. But we would love for everyone watching today to scan that code and answer these two questions. One, like which Clear Creek campus is closest to you? Or, or maybe you're watching outside the Houston Bay Area. That'd be helpful for us to know. And then second, have, have you ever attended one of our five campuses in person? So as you scan that, let me tell you this. Whether this is your first time engaging with us online or you've been a part of our church family for a long time, we believe that the church is a people, not a place. We're a family you can belong to, not just a service you attend or, or you watch online. And so if you wanna get connected with us or take a next step this week, or, or if you're on mission with us and you want to give online, you can do all of that by going to clearcreek.org. You can explore all the different ways you can connect this week. But listen, today we gather online to worship, to hear from God, to respond to Him. And so can we just begin in a time of prayer? I'd love for a chance just to pray for you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for what you want to do in us today, for the things that you wanna to say to us. God, would you open our hearts? Would you open our minds? God, would you allow us to hear from your Holy Spirit as we open the scriptures and we hear from Yancey today? God, we love you. We trust you at this time. In Jesus' name we pray together, amen. I did something last week I rarely do. I, I watched a movie. Now, I'm not a movie watcher, I'm a book reader, and I know that you can be both. I tend to just want to be one over the other, so I'd rather read a book than, than watch a movie. But I did watch one. My cable provider was providing these free movies, and there was a movie out there that I wanted to watch because from a director that I really like. So I tend to, when I do watch movies, follow directors instead of just kind of any trailer uh, because there are certain directors I just trust to tell good stories. One of those guys is Christopher Nolan. Uh, he's directed things like Memento and Interstellar, uh, Inception, Dunkirk. He did the Batman, the, the whole Dark Knight trilogy, and every movie he's ever done that I've seen, I've really liked. So when I noticed that uh, he was, uh, that, that my cable provider was showing his latest release, Tenet, uh, I thought, man, I'm going to grab my kid and we, <clears throat> one of my children, and we watched it together. And once again, he didn't, he didn't disappoint. I mean, I didn't know what the movie was about at the end because I was confused, but uh, overall, <laughs> still pretty good. I just was very confused. Time trial is just all kinds of stuff. But one of the things I like about him is that I can expect in almost every movie that he does, there's going to be a plot twist. Something's going to happen. If you don't know what a plot twist is, it's a, it's a literary device whereby an unexpected radical change or development's introduced into the storyline. There's been a, this new revelation that, that's not only introduced into the storyline, it changes the storyline. It changes the whole way that it falls. And it's the moment in a movie where a lot of people, they'll gasp, or, you know, their, their, their jaw kind of unlocks, like, what? It's... it's it's Bruce Willis's character in The Sixth Sense when you find out at the end that he's been dead the whole time, right? Now, again, if I just spoiled it for you, tough. It's been out forever. That's on you, <laughs> all right? <clears throat> it's, it's that old school Planet of the Apes movie where uh, you've got Charlton Heston's character, an astronaut who goes at 2,000 light years on a journey and crash lands on a planet only to find as he gets to the end of the story, the end of the movie, that he goes on a beach and sees the Statue of Liberty and he realizes... I've crashed on the planet Earth that's just 2,000 years later. 
It's just such a movement. It was a, like a cinematic moment. I'll, I'll, give you a, I'll give you another one, and this is from the 80s, actually 1980. It defined my generation, and I bet you know which one it is too. And I'll give the line, Luke, I am your father. <laughs> What's that? What series is that from? Star Wars. It's The Empire Strikes Back. It's where Darth Vader reveals. I mean, I remember being in the theater, and when that happened, you could hear everyone go, what? No way. Oh, my gosh. How creepy. You know, I just kind of, but that was the moment, right? That was a plot twist. And just like the other ones I mentioned, those plot twists, they're new revelations that get introduced. You, you were thinking one way, but then it goes another, <clears throat> and it changes the whole story. Now, we're in a series called Plot Twists. And the reason we are is that the Bible is a lot like that's full of stories too. True stories and also stories that talk about truth. And that a lot of those stories tell us about who God is and who we are and what life's all about. And many of those stories actually have a twist in it. You're thinking it's going one way and it goes the other. And I want to look at some of those stories. I actually want to take one today. I want to talk to you about one of the plot twists uh, that the Bible has concerning the topic of salvation. Now, salvation is a big thing to talk about, right? Because it's salvation, being delivered, being saved. <clears throat> Some people might use this, the euphemism of going to heaven, those kinds of things. Because if you ask people, like if you were just doing a man on the street, hey, uh, you know, what does it take to actually get to heaven? And people would say generally the same kind of bunch of things. They'd say, well, <clears throat> you can be religious, you need to do good things, you need to remain moral. In other words, just be a good person. Now, you would think, yeah, but that's what people outside the church think. Nah, it's actually what a lot of people inside the church think. In a January 2020 survey, um, one out of every two people that identified as Christians said, and I quote, uh, if, you are a generally, if a person is generally good or does enough good things during their life, they'll earn a place in heaven. So as they see it, when you, when you read the Bible and you understand what God says about himself and about you and I and about life and about salvation, you're going to come to the general conclusion that if you're pretty good, you're going to earn your way into heaven. Now, I'm not saying that's what it says. In fact, I think it says something quite different. That's the plot twist we're going to get into today. But if you do think that way, that's how you think. Like, I really do think, you know, put a little Jesus in there. That's great. But overall, if you're a good person, it doesn't matter where you are. God's going to take you with him into his kingdom one day when you die. Um, I, I really do think today's story and the plot twist that it has in it's just, just meant for you. So here's what I want to do. If you have a copy of Scripture or you have it on your smartphone, I'd love for you to turn with me to 2 Kings. Yes, yeah, 2 Kings. Like plot, this whole plot twist, we're like going into stories that people usually skip over. 2 Kings chapter 5. <clears throat> now I'm going to read through this text, and it's, it's quite lengthy. I'm not even going to do all of it just because of, for time's sake. But, but I want to walk you through... Uh, this story that I think, well, I'll let you watch. And, and I don't want to give it away. It has a plot twist in it. So 2 Kings, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's look at the first eight verses. Naaman, so that's the uh, introduction of the character here. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor because by him the Lord, now by the way, the word L-O-R-D, whenever it's capitalized in your books, uh, in, the book, in the book of the Bible, in the books of the Old Testament, that's actually a, a reference to God's personal covenant name with Israel. His name's Yahweh, and they didn't they wouldn't put that into the scripture, so they would just write the word Lord in, in other words. So just so you know, so I'm at God of Israel, because there's gonna be a bunch of different gods in and around here at some point. So it was a great man with his master and in high favor because by him uh, the Lord Yahweh had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man, Naaman was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians, on one of their raids, had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, "Would that my lord were with the were, <clears throat> were that my lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria? Samaria is just a section of Israel at this time. He would cure him of his leprosy." So Naaman went in and told his lord, "Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel." And the king of Syria said, "Go now, and I'll send a letter to the king of Israel." So he went, taking with him the ten talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, <clears throat> and changes of clothing. And Naaman brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes, and here's what he said. And am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? 
Only consider and see he's seeking a quarrel. See how he's seeking a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Let him come, to me. Now, let him come now to me <clears throat> that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. And we're going to stop there. There's more to go, but let me just, that's a huge chunk. Let's break it down. So the story opens up in verse 1 telling us, like, here's the first guy you need to know. There's this guy named Naaman, right? And he's introduced as the commander of the military of Syria, also known as Aram in the Old Testament age, uh, the Arameans. And these guys were, they were kind of terrors to all the nations around them. They were fairly powerful at the time. <clears throat> Indeed, we find that in Naaman's household, there's a slave, a servant girl, uh, that was captured from one of the many raids that Syria did into, uh, into Israel. So in one of those incursions, they took back this little girl, and now she's a slave in the home of uh, Naaman. We also find out that Naaman, as great as he is, has leprosy, quote-unquote leprosy, because the reason I'm air-quoting this is because the Hebrew word for leprosy doesn't just mean technically leprosy. It means some kind of skin disease. So here's what we do know. Whatever skin disease he had, it didn't keep him from dominating on the military field, but it was bad enough that he wanted to be healed by it. So in really this act of grace, even early in the story, this little slave girl from Israel says, well, listen, I got this prophet from back home. He's living in Samaria right now named Elisha, and he can heal you, Lord, from your leprosy, from your skin disease. And so like Naaman's like, I'm all in, right? <clears throat> so what he does is he runs off to his own king, uh, a guy named Ben-Hadad, who's the king of Syria at the time. And he's like, listen, man, uh, this, this person back in Israel, there's just some kind of prophet uh, that can heal me. And he's like, oh, dude, let's do it. Because he's like, Naaman's one of his faves. And so he's like, here's what I'll do. I'll write a letter to Joram, who happens to be the king of Israel, and I'll just grease the wheels for you. You know why I need to grease the wheels for you? Because the Israelites don't like us. You know why they don't like us? Because we kind of raid their country. Like, don't you have a servant girl from Israel? Yeah, I can. well, let me write a letter and just kind of smooth things over. And then, in fact, and, 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 and let's move them over uh, even more, because when you look at the text, it says in the second half of verse 5 that he brings with them this, these precious metals. Now, we don't, we don't work in talents or shekels, so here's, here's what it would eventually uh, amount to. He brings, Naaman brings with him about 750 pounds of silver and about 150 pounds of gold. Now, the gold alone was worth about an annual wage for 600 workers. It's a lot of, that's a lot of bank right there, a lot of cheese. And it says he also brought some changes of clothes. That wasn't because he was going to be there long. It was because this was offering. It's, uh, that was also what he was going to offer <clears throat> to, to Israel on behalf of their God so that he would be delivered by his skin disease, from his skin disease. So here's what happens. Naaman, as we see in the text, arrives in Israel. Uh, King Joram of Israel reads the letter, and he freaks out. How do you know he freaks out? Because he says he tore his clothes. Now, he doesn't tear his clothes because he doesn't like wearing cardigans. That's not why. He tears his clothes because, uh, Israel, because Israelites, and even uh, Orthodox Jews to this day, when something shocking happens or they, they, they're in a place where they want to bemoan their situation, they tear their clothes as an act of, 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 of signifying that something's gone horribly awry. And so Joram reads this letter and he tears his clothes because he says this. He's like, listen, man, this, this letter is just, this is just a pretense for war. This is a ruse because he's like, I'm sending you my boy Naaman and I want you to heal him of his skin disease. What? Then he says this, what am I, God, to kill and to make alive? This man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy. Like, I, I'm a king, buddy. Just like you are, Ben Haddad. I can't, I don't have, I don't have any, I'm not God. I can't heal anybody of this. So he's like, this guy just wants to, he, oh, I get it. He knows that we can't heal him, so he's just going to use this as a pretense to invade us later on. And so he freaks out. Now, here's how this first part ends. <clears throat> Elisha, who happens to be the prophet of Israel, he hears about this. And then he sends his messenger, sends a word to, to, to Joram, the king of Israel. He's like, yo, king, what's up? Why are you tearing your cardigan? Like, why are you, why are you, why are you getting upset? Why are, you, why, are you, why are you freaking out? This guy wants to come. He wants to know who the God of Israel is. Tell him to come to my house. And notice what he says here. Let him come now to me that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. In other words, like, this is kind of code word for saying, let him come to my place and he'll see the one true God. Now, this is, this is awesome because... What Naaman's doing coming over to Israel is a big bet on Naaman's part. You know why? Like the other pagan nations, the Syrians or the Arameans, they, they were polytheistic. If you don't know what that means, it means that they believed in a lot of gods. 
They had a lot of gods. The God of Israel was not one of them. They believed in all these gods, and they believed those gods gave them their power and their prestige, gave them strength in battle, their victories, even gave them, and we'll come back to this later, the land that they had as a country. And so Naaman's like, I'm kind of leaving my gods to go to this little puny place called Israel. We beat up on them all the time, and they got just one god, a god named Yahweh. <laughs> but when you're sick of being sick, You'll do whatever it takes to try to get healthy. So he takes a flyer and goes. Now here's what happens. Let's look at this text. Let's get back into the story. Naaman takes, is willing to take a chance, and so here's, what, here's how it goes down. <clears throat> so Naaman came with his horses and chariots. So he's rocking it, man. He comes up there, rolls up. It's kind of the ancient version of coming in like a rolls. So he comes up there, stands at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan, that's a local river, Jesus baptized in the Jordan, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and he went away saying, behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of Yahweh, his God, the Lord is God, and wave his hand over the place, apparently the place where he was, and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farfar, a Farpar, Uh, The rivers of Damascus, Damascus is in Syria, so he's talking about, hey, are not my home rivers uh, better than all the waters of Israel? Can I, do, can I not wash in them and be clean? It's almost humorous here. So here's what happens. <clears throat> Naaman shows up, knocks on the door, and Elisha doesn't even have the common courtesy to greet him. He sends an errand boy, and the errand boy's like, yeah, my master says uh, that you need to jump into the river seven times. Now, what you need to understand is in the ancient world, numbers meant stuff. We even see that in the New Testament as well. The number seven was the number that signified completion, uh, oftentimes signified perfection. So in other words, like you need to completely douse yourself in the water, kind of do a ritual washing completely in the Jordan River, just right here, this local river, and you'll be healed. And and it's not for some reason we'll find out really quickly what it is, but this just, what's the word? I don't don't want to say it in here because this is, you know, we're having service, but I'm just like, let's just say this. Naaman's ticked off. (laughs) He's mad because he's insulted. And the reason he's insulted, well, there's a lot of reasons. Number one, he's the king's boy from Syria. He's rolled up in a chariot with horses to show like, look how great I am, dude. I'm amazing, right? I'm the commander of the Syrian army, one. Number two here, as we look at the text, like, you you don't even have the common courtesy to meet me. Like you send an air, your, your message boy to talk to me. Uh, three, I'm bringing gifts to you, dude. Like have you seen this much gold and silver, these changes of amazing clothes like this? I'm bringing it to you and you're still not doing anything. Four, you don't even come out personally and here's Yahweh, Yahweh heal. You don't do anything like that. I don't even see all I have is a message like go jump in a river seven times and you'll be healed. See, it's a plot twist. It's a plot twist for Naaman because he's an ancient guy, and ancient guys thought like this. Here's the standard operating procedure when you lived in that world. When you wanted something from the gods, the standard operating procedure was you presented before them how great you were. Like you gave them your greatness and they responded with their greatness. So you showed them like how worthy you were to be delivered by them, to be healed by them, to be, be, if you will, quote unquote, saved by them. So that's what you did. You showed up and like, this is how good I am, gods. So you guys respond in kind. I'll show you by my treasures, by my power, by my prestige. I'll offer them to you because this is how good I am. Remember how the story opens, by the way? Let's go back to verse one. We'll highlight this for you. Notice how name is described. He's not just some ordinary dude. He's the commander of the army of the king of Syria, one. He's a great man with his master, two. So he's like the king's right-hand man, his boy. Three, he's held in high favor. Four, he's a mighty man of valor. Like, he, he's the guy you put a poster of and your kids will look at in Damascus. Like, he's, the, he's a Syrian rock star, if you will, for these guys. He is as great as they come. And by the way, the, the gifts that he brings, that 600 uh, workers' annual wages, just shows how legit he is. It's not like how gracious he is. It shows you, it legitimizes him. It's like, here's how worthy I am to be healed. And if anyone is able to earn divine deliverance, well, it's, 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 it's Naaman. It's Naaman. <clears throat> but what makes him so angry is that this Elisha character and his God, Yahweh, they're, they're like running by some different script in the movie. 
because they're treating him like he's some common dude, like he's just a nobody, like he's like maybe a sinner. Like they just don't, they're not rolling out the red carpet and they're, they're not doing anything. They're like, you jump in a river. What? And then did you hear how he responds? Like, I could have done this back home. By the way, he, he puts a little dig at Israel, like, listen, our rivers are way better than their rivers. Why can't I just, you could have sent me a note, jump in a river, swim around seven times, and you'll be healed. Why do I have to do it in Israel? This place is horrible. So there's, he can't handle it. Man of great stature can't handle it. So he takes off. He's like, done, I'm out, I'm out. They traveled all this way, he's out. Here's what happens. His servants try to kind of like talk him off the ledge. Watch this. <clears throat> Second half of verse 12. So Naaman term, turned and went away in a rage. He just rage quits. He just can't handle it. But his servants came near and said to him, my father, notice how much respect they're giving the dude. I mean, he's not, again, he's a, he's a big boy. My father, it is a great word the prophet, excuse me, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? He has, has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? In other words, like, they're like talking sense into him. Like he's so prideful. It's like, oh man, do you, time out, dude. Did you realize, Lord, that like our great master, you heard that prophet, all he said was like, all you had to do to, be clean. All you had to do to be healed was just go in the river. Let's just, just do it. So Naaman went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan River according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was, what's the word, y'all? He was clean. Flesh restored like the flesh of a little. He had like smooth as a baby's bottom. That's how I would return that. It's, it's not technically what it says, but you can go with me there. So what happens here? Naaman does, simply as Elijah commands, go wash in the river seven times. He does it, and he's healed. Now, here's what you're going to see that, to me, the plot twist gets even crazier. So you think he's going to come out and go, that's cool. I mean, look at this, man. My skin's normal. Better than that. Not only is he restored, not only is he cleansed and saved physically, that redemption actually works its way into who he is. He comes out a different person. Watch this. <clears throat> then Naaman returned to the man of God, Elisha, he and all of his company, so he brings everybody back. And he came and stood before him. And he said, behold, this is Naaman talking. I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel, so accept now a present from your servant. But Elisha said, as Yahweh, as Yahweh lives, as the Lord lives, before whom I stand, I will receive none. And Naaman urged him to take it, but he refused. Then Naaman said, if not, Please let there be given to your servant two mule loads of earth, for from now on your servant will not offer, not offer burnt offerings, a burnt offering or sacrifice to any God but Yahweh, any God but the Lord. In this matter, may Yahweh pardon your servant. So he has a new idea here. It's, what, what is it? When my master, the king, uh, king Ben-Hadad, goes into the house of Rimen, which is a pagan place of worship, to worship there, Leaning on my arm, and I bow myself in the house of Rimen. When I bow myself in the house of Rimen, Yahweh, pardon your servant in this master. And Elisha said to Naaman, all right, go in peace. Now let me explain what's going on here. This is a huge plot twist in the story. What did I tell you a plot twist is? It's an unexpected revelation that changes the story itself. So Naaman not only realizes, right, <clears throat> that, God, uh, th th that God is going to heal him, of his leprosy, of his skin disease, right? So he, he doesn't, he's not only coming to the conclusion that he's been healed, here's what he's coming to the conclusion. Um, I've been all my life worshiping all these gods. And it's this one God of Israel, this one God named Yahweh that's proven himself to be true. You know what? I'm not a polytheist anymore. I'm gonna dump all the gods I grew up with and I'm gonna become a believer in the God of Yahweh. In fact, I'll give my life to Yahweh now. It's an amazing turn of events. So here's what happens. Now what does Naaman do? He doesn't just take off and go home. He feels obligated. He goes back to see Elisha, and now guess what happens? Elisha sees him face to face. Now he comes and meets him, now that he's met the one true God. And Elisha doesn't, doesn't talk. It's Naaman the one who talks. And he says in verse 15, I'll quote it again. Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. What a big claim, dude. I mean, again, you're a Syrian, you're a court official, uh, Ben-Hadad is your master. By the way, Ben-Hadad, Hadad is God of the storm, also known as Rimen. So it's like this guy's treated as divine, the guy he works for, and he's like, nope, turning my back on all those guys. Listen, man, there's one true God, I'm going to be his follower now. And then what he does, because he's so grateful, 
He's, he's like, here, man, uh, Elisha, take these gifts. Thanks, man. Thanks for letting Yahweh do that. And what does Elisha do? He's like, I can't take this. It's a stool. No, he says, I can't take this. I can't take these gifts. I can't take these gifts at all. Why does he reject the gift? Here's why. Because Elisha wants Naaman to know that the healing, the deliverance, the salvation that he's received has all been by the hands of Yahweh and not the hands of Elisha, his prophet. He hadn't touched it. He's done nothing. I told you to jump in a river seven times. That's all I did. God's the one that saved you. Here's why it needed to happen that way. Naaman was of the opinion, like everyone else says, you got to earn your salvation. And so it needed to be very clear to Naaman that what he received from Yahweh, what he received from the Lord, had nothing to do with what Naaman was bringing to the table. Your prestige, your power, your potency, your reputation, even your gifts, they don't matter anything. I mean, frankly, you're going to give your gifts to God Someone who has everything, what, what, it's not going to make an impact. God already owns it all anyhow. No, 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 no. God healed you out of his mercy. And then Naaman does something in here that's a really weird request to people who have modern ears, all of us. He says, okay, can I load up a couple of, can I get a couple of mule loads of dirt and take it back to Syria? And you're like, what? They don't, they don't have a Ma's nursery back up in there? You don't have an EDS? They don't have a Home Depot? We can get you some sod. Why would he do so? That sounds weird. Here's why that is. In the ancient world, uh, and I said this earlier, uh, people tied the gods to the land that they lived in. By the way, Israel's no different. What was Canaan called, the, the precursor to Israel? It was called the promised what? The promised land. God promised it to us, right? So the Israelites felt the same way, that the land was tied to the gods and the gods were tied to the land. If you're an Israelite, it was just one God. Yahweh owned the land of Israel. That was his land. In fact, what does Moses say when he meets Yahweh in the burning bush? Uh, we hear from the word of the Lord, take off your shoes because you're on holy what? You're on holy ground. They tied the land to the God. And it, it applied to all the nations, including Israel. So here's what happened. So now that Naaman, a Syrian, is now going to be a true worshiper of the God of Israel, he can't stay in Israel. He got a job. He's back in Syria. So if he can't stay in Israel, he can take Israel with him. So he's like, can I get some dirt? Because this is holy ground. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that dirt back. I'm probably going to put it on the ground. Uh, and I'm going to use that as holy ground. And then I'm going to build an altar out of that dirt. He says here in verse 17, that your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any god but Yahweh. <laughs> That's pretty big. All these other gods you've been worshiping. Now you're not going to worship them? I swear to you, makes you know, I will not offer a burnt offering or sacrifice to any god but Yahweh, and I'm even going to use the dirt from this place to do it. <laughs> it's a little ironic that Naaman left Syria with the precious Syrian metals that everyone thought was a treasure, and he comes back with Israelite dirt that he thinks is more of a treasure now. Because that's what happens when you become a true believer. He'd rather meet the true God than be truly delivered from all these other things. And then how the story ends, there's more to the story, by the way. Y'all can read it. We just don't have the time to do it all. But as Naaman's concerned, Here's what Naaman does. He says, I got one more thing, man. Um, <laughs> I'm a Syrian. I'm in the court. Like, one of my jobs is because King Hadad is uh, old and frail, fragile, is that I have to, when he goes to worship his pagan gods, now that I'm a believer, they're all pagans, right? Now that, now that he's worshiping his god at the house of Rimen, another name for the storm god, I've got to help him as his court official. And when he bows, I have to help him bow. And I'm just going to ask, is it okay with Yahweh if I still have that job? Because I won't worship Rimen. I will only worship Yahweh. Can, can at least, if, if he's not okay, can Yahweh at least forgive me for still staying with that job? To which uh, Elijah repli Elisha replies, okay, you're good. Go in peace. <laughs> it's, just, it's just an amazing, amazing move here. So he goes out released to be a missionary back in Syria. A completely different person. Now, that's the plot twist. And, and what does it teach us? God teaches us so much about God and his goodness and salvation. See, here's, here, here's the deal, y'all. <clears throat> like Naaman, I would argue most of us, I'm not speaking most of us as in this building or in our campuses or in our church. I'm saying, or even most Christians, although I wonder. I'm, I'm thinking most people, when they think about God, they think they have salvation figured out. It's like you give God a little bit of your attention. You know, you show up at a service, go to Easter or Christmas, do whatever. I don't, you know, do a little bit of that. Then kind of just be moral enough. Like, be a good old boy. Be a good old girl. Have your friends. Have your fun. Don't do anything that's too bad, too off the radar. 
Two, where people will waggle their finger at you. If you just can kind of stay somewhat on the straight and narrow, here's what's going to happen. When you die, God's going to take you and he's going to take all the other good people with you. That's what's going to happen, right? And so people start to think that. And what that does is it still leaves you in control. You can still be like Naaman. Still keep your pride. Still keep your power. Still keep your prestige. In fact, you don't ever have to surrender anything. You can still be the, uh, the consumer that you want to be. Make your own shots. Be your own boss. You can do it all. Because you don't really have to have God, you just want to use God. Because you don't need God, you just need to be moral, right? And so what happens is you start to think about your power and your prestige and all your possessions. Like those are the things that make you you. And now all of a sudden now you're starting to like use your esteem and your worth in those things. Like that's what I do, man. Look at what I have. Look at the businesses I've created. Look at the people that I have. Look at the money that I've earned. Look at the boat that I got. Look at the cul-de-sac that I live in. God, I'm a good dude, man. My kids are okay. They're not that crazy. And so all this stuff, look at this. I, you're going to want me in heaven. At least I don't deserve to go to hell. So let's just do it that way, Lord. That's the way it should be. So when you think through all that stuff, listen, we noted from the beginning, or I noted from the beginning, this is the predominant view of how people think that God saves in his goodness, that he just looks at your goodness and you kind of have a deal. You be good to me, I'll be good to you. And so what happens, you're like kind of naming. You're saying, here's my worthiness, God. Look how worthy I am. And so, good for good. I'm worthy. I get to merit your favor. I get to earn it. But that's the plot twist. Naaman thought that, and he was dead wrong. No, 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 no. Here's what Naaman learned at the end of this. That salvation doesn't come by achieving. It comes by receiving. Listen, my whole point to this message, and it's a very simple message, is this. Salvation doesn't come by achieving. It comes by receiving. Notice there's a big difference. You're, you're not the doer in salvation. God is. He always has been. That's not some kind of Jesus move that I just did at the end of the book. That's all the way in the Old Testament. This is St. Kings, y'all. This is like in the Old Testament, the books of the Bible, way before Jesus comes on the scene. It's always been about God's grace. People think about this. Listen, um, it, it's never, salvation never comes by your goodness. It always comes by God's grace. The road to heaven, if you will, if I could put it this way, is never on the stones of merit, always on the stones of mercy. Always, 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 always. And that's hard for people, and I'll tell you why. Because when they hear that salvation is by receiving God's grace, not by achieving because of your goodness, it offends us like it offends Naaman. What are you talking about, man? I'm a good person. Why wouldn't God want me, right? We see it as an affront to our sense of who we are and our sense of being, right? We're the earners. Come on. We're the accomplishers. I get to decide my fate and my destiny. Nope. Not, not to God. Not to Yahweh. In fact, a very well-known verse to many Christians is Romans 3, chapter, or chapter 3, verse 23, where it says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is what God thinks. God doesn't look around and go, wow, look at all these people I'm so lucky to have with me. He's like, well, um, I'll just judge people and evaluate them by my goodness, not their goodness. And my goodness happens to be perfection. Well, that knocks basically everybody out, everybody out. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, when God says, listen, if you want to come the goodness route, you're going to be in deep trouble because no one is good enough. Not Naaman, not Elisha, not Yancey Arrington, not you, not any of us. And yet, what does God do? God is good to us. Here's how he's good to us. He knows that we'll never merit salvation, we'll never earn it, we'll never be good enough that we've fallen short of his glory. So what does he do? He sends himself through the person of his son to do exactly what you and I were supposed to do, but couldn't. But Jesus comes and does. He's perfect. He obeys the Father. He loves everything that God's supposed to love and hates everything God is supposed to hate. And then what does he do? He gets up upon a cross to take our place and dies at the cross, taking the penalty of our sins, and rises from the dead to show his victory over it all. And yet, what does God ask for us in all of this? Here's what he asks. He's like, here's the deal. Here's what you need to do. I need you to humble yourself. What? Like, yeah, you heard me right. If you, if you want to receive salvation from me, Yahweh would say, through Jesus now, you've got to humble yourself. What do you mean I've got to humble myself? Just like Naaman. It's not on your ability. It's humility. It's humility. It's not ability. It's my ability, not yours. You, you broke the thing. I'll fix it in Christ for you. So, okay, well, what is the, what's the humility part? Of it? Here's the humility part. 
you got to stop trusting in your own self to be worthy enough for God and trust that Jesus has been worthy enough for you. You want to know the secret? That's the secret, and it ain't no secret. It's been as clear through the scriptures for the last 2,000 years, and I would say 2,000 plus. God saves people when they come to the end of themselves. I say, you know what? I'm not going to be good enough. As good are the things that God's given me, and as much as the blessings I've received, I'm still not going to make the cut because I'm not, number one, perfect. Number two, I still have a lot of holes in my swing, a lot of sin that I have to deal with where I realize I'm far from God. But God in his mercy says this, I'll save you, I'll redeem you, I'll clear up not just your skin, I'll clear up your soul if you'll just humble yourselves and make me the true Lord and master of your life. That's what Jesus always said. That's what God said before him. And when you do that, when you humble yourselves, when you realize it's by, uh, it's by grace, not by your goodness, it changes everything. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says it this way. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is another well-known text. For it's by grace you have been saved through faith. Notice it's not by goodness. It's not by your goodness. It's by God's grace that you've been saved. How? Through faith. So you're trusting God to be good for you in Jesus. And this is not your own doing, as if we needed to know this more. And this is not of your own. Your salvation is not of your own doing. Why? It's the gift of God, not a result of works. Why would it be that way? So that no one will what? You're not going to talk trash. So you can bring all your chariots, y'all. Bring all your horses. Bring all the businesses you've created. Bring all the kids that you've had. Bring all the degrees that you've earned. Bring it all. It doesn't mean anything to the God who owns it all anyhow. Here's what you've brought also as well as I have. You've been a traitor to God as well as I've been. You've brought your disobedience as well as I brought my disobedience. That's what God's stuck with, and yet what does he do? He loves you enough in his goodness to send Jesus to be good for you. You can't come to God and trade goodness for goodness. It doesn't work like that. You want to get saved, you've got to trade your guilt for his grace. That's what Naaman learned. Isn't it kind of interesting also that when people come to Jesus and they get saved by trusting solely in who Jesus is and what he's done and not in their self-merit, isn't it interesting that the sign and symbol, the the covenant sign of coming to Jesus is actually jumping in the water and coming to get baptized? Because we also declare as we come up out of that water that, that it isn't about our goodness to God, it's about God's goodness to us already in Jesus. It's not about what I'm doing. It's about what God's already done in Christ. Because the gift of Jesus has always been about mercy and never been about your merit. And that's a wonderfully good thing to hear. So I'm, I'm done. Let me ask you about this. Where are you with that? Like you could have grown up in church all your life and, never, and always thought, no, nah, it's kind of about me, 50%, Jesus, 50%. You know, me being good enough or maybe not even Jesus. Just as long as I'm a good old boy or good old girl, I'm going to be fine. But Naaman shows us, and a lot of other places besides Naaman, that if you're trusting in any one of those things outside of just who Jesus is and what he's done, it's not salvation you've found. You've just found the end of yourself. But you have to come to the end of yourself if you're going to find salvation. You can't trade good for good, but you can trade your guilt fine, for God's grace. That's what God wants for us. Salvation comes with humility, not ability, and it's the greatest plot twist ever. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the goodness of Jesus. Thank you that he's become the goodness that I could never be. And I need it. And I need that grace every day. And I'm thankful that you change hearts like Naaman's and Elisha's and mine and countless others who have come before you and turned from trusting in themselves to wholly trust in you as much as they know, as much as they can. And so, Lord, I'm, I'm just grateful, Lord, that you love us in spite of ourselves, that you love us deeply and you've shown us mercy and that your goodness to Naaman, a pagan of all things, a guy wasn't even a part of the commonwealth of Israel. You showed a guy that was beaten up on your people and you brought him in. And you changed his heart, which gives me hope that you save anyone at any time. But if you do, it's all by your grace, not by our goodness. And for that, we're all grateful. So Lord, we pray that you would renew us in that grace every day. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You gave your life for mine Nailed to the cross You crucified all my sin and shame it was washed by your mercy now 
praise to the Lord Most High, like my King forever. Y'all, music in a worship service is intended to help us respond to the gospel of Jesus. So when we hear Yancey talk about the fact that salvation is something we receive, not something we try and achieve, I mean, that should cause us to worship God. 
to give all praise to the Lord Most High, to lift our hands, to, to lay down our lives, to claim Jesus as King. So listen, music isn't the only way we respond to the gospel. It's an aspect of our worship, but not all of it. See, prayer, quiet reflection, that's another way that God calls us to respond to respond to what we just sang, to what we just heard in a sermon, to respond to what the Holy Spirit might be stirring in each of us. And so today, as a part of our worship service, I want to give you an opportunity just to be quiet before the Lord, to listen. Listen, I know that, that online, it's really easy just to scrub through parts of the video that you wanna skip through, right? But I really believe that God wants to meet you right where you are today. God wants you to respond to him and tell him what you're thinking, to sit quietly, just let him speak to you. And so if you don't know where to start, as we pray, I want you to think about this question. How have you seen God's goodness, God's mercy in your own life? Like how have you experienced God's restorative grace? So take a few minutes, reflect on that now. Let's pray together. Today is your first time connecting with Clear Creek and, and maybe you've been considering attending one of our five campuses. We would love for you to join us next week as we continue our plot twist series in person. Listen, we said worship is our response to who God is, right? And, and for those who need to continue to worship online, we wanna provide great online content for you to be able to do that. But we also know that experiencing the presence of God with the people of God is really significant too. And so you can explore our five campuses online at clearcreek.org. We would love for you to join us. But listen, I pray that we would all this week see God's goodness, that we'd worship in response because grace is something we receive, not something we achieve. Clear Creek, we love you. God bless.